Um, today we have the honor of hosting Rafael Clamart all the way from UC Santa Barbara. And she started her career with an MSI in chemistry at the University of Cambridge, where she also then went on to do a PhD under the supervision of Professor Claire Gray. Her thesis was titled Theoretical Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Studies of Sodium Transition Metal Oxide Materials for Sodium Iron Battery Cathodes. Raphael then completed a postdoc at UC Berkeley in the Department of Material Science and Engineering before joining the Materials Department at UC Santa Barbara as an assistant professor in 2018. She's won many awards, most recently the prestigious National Science Foundation Early Career Award, which recognizes her effective integration of innovative research and education. Raphael's group, focuses on elucidating the relationship between the stru structure and electrochemical properties of inorganic materials used in rechargeable batteries and fuel cells. So I'll hand over to Raphael to tell us more about your work. Thank you so much, Kara, for this nice introduction. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Great. So good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to give a talk here at, in London from California. <laughs> um, and so today I'm going to talk about some of the recent work we've been doing in my group. So as I mentioned, I moved to Santa Barbara uh, about three years ago. And uh, so my group specializes in solid state NMR methods, and maybe more broadly, NMR methods to look at uh, battery materials. And so today I'm going to talk about the relationship between the structure and especially the order and disorder of structures and how that impacts ionic conduction in battery materials. So the work I'm going to show you today is really motivated by the need to find be better battery materials uh, to enable the, uh, the transition, the energy transition. And so here particularly, we're interested in um, new battery electrolytes. And so as you can imagine, batteries are used in uh, many applications and especially in electric vehicles. But uh, the adoption is, of these uh, vehicles is slowed down by a number of issues, including range anxiety, which is basically dependent on the energy density of your battery and the limited energy density. Charging times also limited by the power density of your battery. So how fast you can charge and discharge your battery. Um, you also have some issues of safety with current battery systems, um, issues of operable temperature range and high cost. And so a lot of these issues can be mitigated by going from liquid electrolytes that we're using today to solid electrolytes. So today I'm gonna to talk about new solid electro electrolytes materials that we've been studying in our group. So solid electrolytes are also useful for safer and more energy dense batteries that you can use in portable electronics and aviation. So not just electric vehicles. And eventually, you can also use these types of batteries for long cycle life and low maintenance uh, battery systems, say for grid scale energy storage. So to start with, I want to show you how a battery works and um, the type of liquid electrolytes that we're using today. So the main components of your battery are the two electrodes. So you have an anode, a cathode, and these two electrode materials are the ones that store charge. So they're able to store this energy um, that you have in a battery in the form of lithium ions, for instance, in the case of a lithium ion battery. And then you have the electrolyte between these two electrodes that allow these lithium ions to shuttle back and forth during charge and discharge between the two electrodes. And so to be concrete here, in the charged state, so if your battery is completely charged, your lithium ions are going to be in the anode material. And as you discharge your system, your battery, your lithium ions are extracted from the structure of the anode material. They'll flow through the electrolyte and they'll insert into the structure of the cathode material. And this is accompanied by redox reactions. So you have release of electrons from the anode through the external circuit to the cathode. And on this, on charge, sorry, so the reverse process, uh, everything is reversible. So your lithium ions are now extracted from the cathode material, they don't flow through the electrolyte in the reverse direction and they'll reinsert into the anode material. And your electrons again are flowing uh, through the external circuit in the reverse direction. So you get a rechargeable battery because you have these reversible processes of lithium ion insertion and extraction from materials during charge and discharge. Uh, 
Uh, so the electrolyte here is key because it's the one that's enabling this shuttling of lithium ions between the two electrodes. So some of the performance metrics of batteries are the gravimetric capacity, which is basically the amount of charge you can store per unit mass of your battery. And so this is basically the amount of lithium that you can transfer between your two electrodes during charge and discharge divided by the mass of the cell. Uh, the energy density is then this capacity times the voltage of the cell. Uh, and finally, the power of your battery is how much um, energy you can deliver in a certain amount of time, and that's the current of your cell times the voltage of that cell. So, um, as I mentioned, current electrolyte systems are liquid, and so typically they are made of, um, you're dissolving a lithium ion salt that allows you to conduct lithium ions here, and typically at high concentrations, so molar concentrations of that salt that is dissolved in a mixture of carbonate solvents. And so if you look at the molecular, at the molecular level, you've got these carbonate solvents molecules um, in, um, in the liquid state. And then you have um, this dissociated salt that contains both your positive ion, your lithium, and a counter ion, PF6 minus in this case. And so these types of electrolytes are beneficial because they have a high ionic conductivity. And so that's really why they're commercialized these days. So they have uh, conductivities on the order of millisiemens per centimeter at room temperature. But what's uh, and one issue with these types of systems is that they have a limited voltage stability. And so why this is problematic is because if you're charging your, your, your battery, your cathode material will go to say 4.5 volts and you're exceeding the stability window of your electrolyte. So then your electrolyte starts to decompose um, at the interface between the cathode and the electrolyte. And so that decomposition system, uh, sorry, that decomposition reaction leads to uh, the formation of uh, a decomposition layer. So it, it's typically uh, electronically insulating, but also can be ionically insulating. And that's a problem because now you can't insert your lithium ion in your cathode anymore. And so this leads to capacity fade. Another issue with these electrolytes is that they have a limited temperature stability. So if you go to too high temperature, uh, your uh, electrolytes, uh, which is also flammable, can start to catch fire. And that's the reason why some of lith lithium ion batteries can catch fire. This is typically due to the electrolyte. And finally, uh, these types of electrolyte systems have a low transference number for lithium. And so what do I mean by this? I mean that in a lithium ion battery, the ion that you really want to conduct in your electrolyte is the lithium. The, the, <clears throat> sorry, the, the counter ion is also going to be um, migrating because of the electric field that you have in a battery. But typically, you want to minimize the conduction of this counter ion, and you want to maximize the conduction of lithium. And so this is measured by the transference number, which is basically uh, the ratio of your lithium conductivity to the total conductivity of your solid electrolytes or of your electrolyte system. So for these liquid electrolytes, that transference number is quite low. It's below 0.5. And you'd want it to be closer to 1 so that you're mostly conducting lithium ions. And so we've been interested in looking at um, alternatives to liquid electrolyte systems. Um, and these are solid electrolytes. But when you introduce a solid electrolyte in this battery, you also have to re-engineer the battery overall. And so here we still have our main components. We have the anode here, we have the cathode here that's become a composite, and we have the electrolyte in the middle. Um, ideally, you want to use a lithium metal anode. This is the most energy dense anode. Uh, so I've depicted it here. On the cathode side, now that you're moving to a solid electrolyte, typically you have a composite that's composed of your cathode material, mixed intimately with the solid electrolytes and with a conductive additive. And the reason for why we are mixing these three is because we want to make sure that we are optimizing um, or we are uh, maximizing the contact area between your cathode and your solid electrolytes. And so that we can maximize lithium ion conduction between at that interface between the two materials. So we have an um, intimately mixed powders here. We still have a layer of solid electrolyte between the two electrodes to make sure that um, 
the, the main reason here is you don't want to have electrons conducting. You don't want to have a short circuit of your cell. Um, and so the advantage of these solid electrolytes is that they're non-flammable. So the safety is enhanced of your battery. Uh, for inorganic solids, they are also very selective to lithium ion motion, to lithium ion diffusion. So they're not conducting any counter ion here. Uh, so the transference number of these systems is equal to one. For polymer electrolytes, now you have a counter ion. So the, the selectivity is a bit lower than inorganic solids, but they are more ductile. So that means that they are softer materials. And so this creates a better interface between your solid electrolyte and your cathode. So it, it improves lithium ion conduction in these interfaces. They are more easily processable and they are also low cost. Um, so these are two types of solid electrolytes that I'll talk about today. But one of the issues with these uh, electrolytes is that typically they have a lower ionic conductivity than the current lithium uh, liquid electrolyte systems. So let's look at, uh, in more detail at, at the mechanism of ionic conduction in these different systems. So if you're looking at a liquid electrolyte, this is your solution here, which contains lithium ions that are solvated by your carbonate molecules, because here we're in a carbonate solvent. And then you have your PF6 minus counter ion. And as lithium is moving through the electrolyte, it's also dragging these carbonate molecules with it. And so the diffusion coefficient of lithium is typically um, modeled by the Stokes-Einstein equation here. Um, and it depends on the hydrodynamic ratio, oh, sorry, hydrodynamic radius of your lithium, as well as the viscosity of the medium. If you now move on to a solid electrolyte, so if you look at um, an inorganic solid <clears throat> where lithium is moving through a periodic lattice and it's hopping between stable sites for lithium, but as it hops, it has to overcome this particular migration energy barrier. Uh, what you see here is that we have a thermally activated process. So the conductivity of our system depends on the activation energy barrier, so the size of that barrier, but it also depends on the temperature of the system because this is a thermally activated system um, process. <clears throat> so it's an Arrhenius type behavior. For polymers, which are also considered solid electrolytes, in this case, you have a polymer matrix, will, which is depicted here by this chain. And your lithium salt is dissolved in this polymer matrix. And so you have lithium ions that are interacting with the polymer and they are being pushed around. So the conductivity happens because your polymer matrix is mobile and uh, the segments of your polymer are pushing lithium ions around the matrix. Um, and so that particular conductivity uh, conducting process can be represented by the vogel folker tamman equation. So now your conductivity depends on the activation energy uh, of segmental motion of your polymer, but it also depends on this T0 um, scaling uh, temperature here, which is related to the glass transition temperature of your polymer. So it's a bit of a, it's a measure of the mobility of your polymer here. So let's focus right now on solid electrolytes and on solid inorganic electrolytes. So these are the ones where you have a periodic lattice, you have a crystalline solids, and your lithium is hopping between stable sites in that crystalline solid. So what you want here is to minimize the activation energy barrier for the, for the hopping process. So you want to have a shallow energy landscape for lithium ions. You also want to have a high concentration of vacancies. So these are vacant sites in your crystalline uh, lattice. And you also want to have, well, either a high concentration of these vacant sites or a high concentration of interstitial sites, as well as appropriate lattice dynamics. Um, and so some of these systems that um, op operate well, so have a high ionic conductivity at room temperature. So room temperature is around here. Um, the blue um, lines here are liquid electrolytes. So this is your benchmark. Uh, ionic conductivity at room temperature, but you can see that you have a, a dark line here, a black line that corresponds to some of the most uh, conducting solid electrolytes. And these are uh, these lithium germanium uh, uh, argyrodite system. So we call them LGPS. Um, and the reason why they're so, such good conductors at room temperature is because they have this BCC type anion lattice. And so a BCC uh, crystal 
has large interstitial sites for lithium ion migration. And that's the reason why you have low energy barriers uh, in these systems. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you want a good solid electrolyte, you can either look for a BCC type anion lattice, or you can look for um, um, systems that have a very large lithium concentration. So one example here is this uh, garnet type structure. And so you can see that the ionic conductivity at room temperature is on the order of 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter, which is really not that bad for a solid electrolyte. And the reason why it has a low conductivity, a, a low, uh, sorry, it has a high conductivity or low uh, migration energy barrier is because you have concerted migration of multiple lithium ions at the same time through the lattice. So let's see how that works. So I've mentioned before that um, in solids, in organic um, electrolytes, your lithium ions are hopping between stable sites. But now let's think of a scenario where you have, you're stuffing uh, lithium ions in these conducting channels in your, in your um, uh, solid. So now you may have some ions that are at the transition state at an unstable um, position. So they are high in energy on that energy landscape and others are at low energy states. And so now if you have one that's hopping between a high energy site to a low energy site, that uh, barrier, you're actually going down in, in energy. You're, you're stabilizing your lithium ion as, as it's moving from that high energy state to the low energy state. And that's compensating for uh, the energy barrier it takes uh, for this other lithium ion that's in a low energy uh, state to, to hop to a higher energy state. So you're kind of compensating the migration barrier of your lithium ion. So that results in a, a lower migration barrier overall. And in fact, this has been computed. So this is density functional theory calculations that look at the migration barrier of lithium. If you have a single hop, so you just have one lithium hopping between sites and you have a migration barrier of about 0.6 EV and that's lowered to about 0.25 EV um, if you have concerted migration. So this is a very efficient process to lower energy barriers in solid electrolytes. Okay, but so the, the types of the systems that I've talked to so far are the sulfides. These are the BCC type crystals and the oxides. And these are the ones like the garnets that can be stuffed with lithium. Um, but the two, these two classes of solid electrolytes are, um, they have a poor electrochemical and chemical stability. And that can be an issue, especially since moving from a liquid electrolyte to a solid electrolyte, you've actually increased the, de the density of your uh, battery. And so in order to have a high gravimetric energy density for a battery, which is the energy that you can store in that battery divided by the uh, unit mass or the mass of that cell, um, you actually need to have um, a lower voltage anode and a higher voltage cathode to compensate for this increased weight of the battery to have a similar energy density as a liquid electrolyte system. And so this can be an issue because the solid electrolytes that we've uh, been able to come up with so far have a poor electrochemical stability. So reducing the voltage of the anode and increasing the voltage of the cathode is going to be problematic. And typically we find that there's a compromise between the stability of your electrolyte and its conductivity. In fact, uh, if you do, again, DFT calculations to look at the stability of different types of uh, electrolyte materials, you find that the sulfides have a very limited voltage stability window. They're only stable between, say, 2 and 2.5 volt versus lithium metal. Oxides do perform a little better, but you have to go to the halides to really have improved um, stability, especially against high voltage cathodes. So if you want to be around 3.5 to 4 volts, you really have to think about halide type solid electrolytes. And so the rest, um, a lot of my talk here is going to focus on these halide systems. And so the uh, research into halide type solid electrolytes really was revived about three years ago uh, by this paper by Asano et al. So these are researchers at Panasonic who found that uh, this lithium yttrium chloride and lithium yttrium bromide systems that have a rock salt type structure have a high ionic conductivity on the order of one millisiemens per centimeter. 
So almost on par with liquid electrolytes. But what they found, and what was interesting here, was that if they made a full electrochemical cell where they have an anode here, a cathode that's lithium cobalt oxide, so it's a high voltage cathode, and if they put this LYC, so basically LYC is this lithium yttrium chloride uh, system, they found that they had a good Coulombic efficiency during the first charge discharge cycle, which means that you have minimal side reactions between your electrodes and your electrolyte. And you had very good capacity retention for about 100 cycles. Same story for this lithium yttrium bromide system, or LYB. Um, and this performed a lot better than sulfide electrolytes that they, uh, they showed here to compare. So the columbic efficiency of these sulfide electrolytes is much worse because of side reactions between the electrolytes and the electrodes. So this is all promising. And what was interesting, um, what they found was interesting for the LYC system was that they made both a low crystallinity version of that solid electrolyte and a high crystallinity version. Uh, the way they made this material was by bull milling uh, or mechanochemical synthesis. Uh, and here you, they are annealing the, the, the material. So they're making it at high uh, temperatures. And what they found was that the conductivity of the low crystallinity system was a lot higher than the, the high crystallinity system. And they also looked at, if you look at this uh, X-ray diffraction pattern obtained on the low crystallinity LYC, you see that you have selective broadening of some of the peaks here. Um, and that can be indicative of planar defects in the system. So I'm gonna talk about these planar defects um, in, my, in our own work uh, in a couple of slides. So at that point, they didn't have much of an understanding of the mechanism of ionic motion in these systems. And so this initial work was followed by uh, theoretical work. And so here, this is the group of uh, Yifei Mo uh, in Maryland, and they did ab initio molecular dynamic simulations to look at um, lithium ion conduction in the system, in the LYC system. And they found that the, they predicted a, a conductivity that was a lot higher than the experimental conductivity. Um, they also found average barriers that were much lower than those obtained experimentally. And so um, the, this seemingly uh, contradicting result um, was explained here in this particular paper by the fact that in this system, in this LYC system, you can have either lithium diffusion between octahedral sites along the C-axis, which is basically this direction here. And then in the XY plane, you have conduction of lithium uh, by hopping from one octahedral site to another octahedral site via a transition, uh, uh, a, a tetrahedral site. And that uh, hopping is much less efficient than along the C-axis because along the C-axis you have uh, two phase sharing octahedra. So you have a direct connectivity between the two sites. And what they suggested was that experimentally, these materials likely have some uh, channel blocking defects. So uh, meaning that the, this is mostly a 1D conductor. And if, you're, if you have a, an ion here, and if you have an impurity ion, then you might be blocking what, some of these 1D channels, leading to reduced conductivity compared to what we would expect for the perfect structure. Um, a final interesting study that I want to discuss here is uh, work by the, the group of Wolfgang Zeyer. And so here they looked at uh, not lithium yttrium chloride, not LYC, but lithium erbium chloride. And so here your metal, your transition metal is erbium <clears throat> and it has exactly the same structure as LYC. And what they found is they made this material uh, using a number of, of different synthesis routes. One was solid state synthesis. So here they're annealing the, the material at high temperatures. Here they are ball milling the, the material. Uh, typically ball milling results in a much more disordered structure than annealing. And this is something in between. Um, and what they found was that uh, the synthesis procedure indeed uh, led to, uh, in the case of ampule synthesis or solid state synthesis, this led to a more ordered system where your erbium are found on this particular position, this erbium one, M1 position and M2 position. And then when you go to the ball mill system, you now have occupation of mostly M1 and M3 sites. So Erbium is sitting on this lattice site and this one here, so in the in a single plane. And that disordering also leads to a decrease in the activation energy barrier for lithium diffusion. So there's a clear correlation here between 
disorder in this structure and ionic diffusion. So in later slides, I'm going to talk about the M1, M2 structure and the M1, M3 structure. What I mean by this is the ordered structure where you have uh, your transition metal in M1 and M2 sites, and then uh, this disordered structure where you have uh, your transition metal in M1 and M3 sites. So we came in this field and really wanting to understand the microscopic mechanism behind uh, the change in the structure here and lithium ion conductivity as we start to disorder the material. And we really wanted to bridge the gap here between experimental and predicted conductivities and the seemingly contradictions that we had seen in the, in the literature. And so we started by making uh, a bull milled version of NYC. And so this is work uh, that was led by Elias in collaboration with Hayden at NIST. Elias is my PhD student. And so we bull milled NYC and uh, we took a synchrotron XRD pattern of this particular system. And we tried to refine the structure using uh, a structure that had been reported before for this particular system. So in this average structure, which has a trigonal uh, space group, P bar three M1, you have uh, yttrium on M1 and partially occupying M2 and M3 sites. And if you use this particular structural model, you find that you're able to uh, fit some of the peaks in your XRD pattern but some of the peaks that are broadened experimentally, so the blue line is the experimental uh, data, um, are not well represented by this average structure. So clearly we have some selective peak broadening in our XRD pattern, which suggests that we have some planar defects or stacking faults in our solid. And so we wanted to understand a little better what these planar defects look like. And we found that the broadened reflections are corresponding to planes of yttrium atoms. So in order to understand uh, the nature and the, the, the fraction of these stacking faults in our, in our system, we used a, a software package that's called Faults, and it allows you to refine your synchrotron XRD data. Um, and, uh, but what we have to input in that model is um, um, a stacking sequence. So it's a sequence of, of layers of atoms uh, to be able to refine our synchrotron XRD pattern. So we started with a, the ordered M1, M2 structure for this system. So we have yttrium in the M1 sites and in the M2 sites. And so if we decompose this particular structure into layers, we have four layers. Uh, two of them have the chlorine atoms um, and the other two have the cations. So in the layer one, you have yttrium in your M1 sites and you have hexagons of, of lithium here. And in layer four, sorry, layer three, you have yttrium in M2 sites and again, some lithium ions around. Um, this is just a top-down view, side-on view of the same structure. And what I'm trying to say here is that if you order layer one, two, three, four in this particular sequence and you repeat this, this gives you the perfect M1, M2 structure. So this is your ordered structure. Now let's introduce some disorder. So we have our one, two, three, four layers. Uh, but we introduce two defective layers now in our model. One has only lithium in the cation layer, and the other one has yttrium in M1 and in M3 positions and some lithium. And so if we introduce these two layers into our model and we start to refine our structure using this full software package, what we found was that uh, introducing a shift of the first layer, layer one, and this is a one third, two third shift in the xy plane, um, that led to uh, the observed peak broadening that we could see in our synchrotron XRD data. Uh, it also introduces phase sharing yttrium chloride octahedra. And we'll see why this is important later. Uh, but we also introduced um, these lithium defect layers and the full yttrium layers into our model. And we found that the best fit we could get of our synchrotron XRD pattern was um, if we had about 30% of the lithium only layers, 20% uh, of the full yttrium layers, and 15% of this shift of the layer one. Um, next thing we did was to look at the evolution of this structure with temperature. So we did, uh, we collected synchrotron XRD data both at room temperature, but then also at 375 Kelvin and at 500 Kelvin. And we looked at the evolution of um, the stacking faults in the system. What we found overall was that 
sorry, I should have said year. Uh, the yellow uh, circles are your non-faulted uh, stacking sequence. So this would be your uh, ordered structure, or the fraction of ordered structure that you have in your material. And this is all uh, different types of defects in your structure. So you may have uh, this shift of um, your layer one, or you can have a full yttrium layer or your lithium only layer. And what we found was that if we increase the temperature, the uh, amount of these defect layers goes down. Uh, what was interesting to us was to see that the lithium only defects in the, at, at room temperature was uh, in higher proportions than your full yttrium layer. And we would expect to have them both at similar proportions if we have a stoichiometric material. And if we increase the temperature, we in, indeed see that they are lying on top of each other. So there is uh, a, a stoichiometric system here. But what this suggests is that at room temperature, we have a bit of lithium over stoichiometry in our system. <clears throat> so the true uh, composition of our system at room temperature is, is more along those lines here. Um, to compare this, so, so far I've talked mostly about the bull milled NYC system. We also made the uh, a more ordered version of NYC using solid state synthesis. So here we are annealing the, the, the material at 500 degrees Celsius. And what we found for this one was that uh, this pattern was actually quite difficult to, to refine because it's multiphasic. It has multiple uh, phases. Um, and one of these phases contains stacking faults. And I'll, I'll get back to this in a few slides. So at that point, um, having a refined model for our bull milled NYC system and seeing that we have all of these planar defects in the system, we wanted to make sure that energetically this was feasible. So we collaborated with um, a theorist, uh, Pierre Kinepa, at uh, in Singapore here, and we did some density functional theory calculations to look at the energe energetics of structural models of NYC that contain these stacking faults. And so here we assessed the stability of about 285 uh, structures which had different arrangements of lithium and yttrium atoms on the cation lattice. Um, and we compared their stability with respect to decomposition into their end members, so lithium chloride and yttrium chloride. And we can get a, what we call a convex hull. So we look at the relative stability of all of these different arrangements of atoms. Um, and what we find here is that most of the structures we looked at were within 30 mEV from the hull. Um, uh, so they're metastable, they're not quite stable, uh, but they are metastable, and they could be ex accessed experimentally, uh, most likely. What we differentiate here are bulk models where uh, these are ordered structures in blue. This is representative of ordered structures where we don't have stacking faults. And the red um, dashed line here are your structures that have stacking faults. And you can see that they lie at a, typically at a higher energy than the ones that don't have stacking faults. But still, some of them are within um, that uh, energy uh, range where we think they could be ac accessed experimentally, especially with a high energy synthesis like mechanochemical, mechanochemical synthesis or bull milling. So uh, what I'm saying here is that um, a lot of these stacking fault structures lie between 25 and 30 MeV above the hole and can be accessed with the types of synthesis methods we're using here. So that confirms that it does seem feasible. Um, so at that point, we wanted to get some other type of evidence for uh, the presence of stacking faults. And since we are a solid state NMR group, we decided to use yttrium NMR to look at yttrium local environments in this particular solid. And so here we're comparing the solids so the NYC system made by solid state synthesis with the bull milled NYC. And in order to interpret these spectra, we actually had to do some DFT calculations of the NMR chemical shifts that we would expect uh, for different types of yttrium environments in these systems. And so this is what we did. We used the CASTEP software package for this. And um, here I'm showing you the results. So we have the, the um, calculated yttrium chemical shift as a function of the number of lithium next nearest neighbors to the yttrium atom. So we're looking here at the local environment and at the uh, relationship between the local environment and the chemical shift. And we did calculations on uh, more ordered structures that would represent the solid state NYC system. 
these are in yellow here, and you can see that they fall into four clear bins uh, with different chemical shifts depending on the number of lithium next nearest neighbor um, uh, arrangement. And uh, this is uh, actually quite consistent with what we see experimentally. We also did uh, calculations on more disordered systems that had uh, phase sharing yttrium chloride octahedra, so they had these stacking faults. And there we didn't see much of a correlation between the yttrium uh, chemical shift and the local environment. And that's reminiscent of what we see for the bull mill system where we really have a much broader um, um, resonance uh, in NMR. So overall, we were able to um, attribute these different resonances we see in the solid state system to different local environments of yttrium. Uh, and for the bull mill system, we see that uh, we likely have some stacking faults, or at least this is consistent with what we would expect for a structure that has stacking faults. So we submitted this paper a couple of months ago. And one of the reviews said, well, sure, you have a lot of evidence for these stacking faults, but you, you're missing this crucial evidence that you would get from electron microscopy. And the reason why we hadn't done electron microscopy to look at these stacking faults in these systems until then was because we thought uh, these structures were too metastable to be um, investigated with a, a high energy electron beam, that the electron beam would damage the structure. And so, after this review, we decided to go back and, and try to get some TEM images. And we did this at cryogenic temperatures. And so this is showing you a TEM image of the solid state NYC system that's a little more stable than the bull mill system. And we actually do see some stacking fault in this system in certain regions uh, shown in orange here. And you also have other regions that are clearly crystalline and don't have these, these stacking faults. They're, they're more, mostly defect free. And this is what we had predicted uh, from our synchrotron XRD data. So this was very consistent with what we had predicted. Uh, so indeed, we can see some stacking faults in these systems. But for the Bullman LYC system, we couldn't get direct evidence for these stacking faults because by the time we tried to look at the material, it had already changed. The structure had changed because of beam damage. Um, so unfortunately, we are unable to say uh, much from these images about stacking faults in Bullman LYC. But we believe that if they are present in the solid state system, then they must be present in much higher concentration in the bull mill LYC system. So this is further evidence that our theory that there are stacking faults in high concentrations uh, in the bull mill LYC system is, is true. All right, so let's look now at the, the, the relationships between structural defects and your ionic conductivity here. So we're going back here to the theoretical calculations. And so these theoretical calculations are able to tell you the energy barrier for hopping between octahedral sites uh, out of plane, so along the C direction, and in plane, so through the tetrahedral sites in the XY plane. And so the energy barriers are shown here for the ordered system, so the M1, M2 structure that I've discussed before, for the more disordered M1, M3 structure that I've discussed before. And then for um, structures that contain the stacking faults that we, we found uh, were present in the bull mill LYC system. And so what you can see here is that for the ordered system, you have, um, as, as expected, a larger energy barrier for in-plane migration through the statuidal sites, a low energy barrier for out-of-plane migration. Uh, the out of, sorry, the in-plane migration barrier goes down as you start to disorder this, the structure. And if you introduce stacking faults, it goes down even uh, further. So now you have very low energy barriers in the stacking fault structures, which is consistent with the fact that we think that the Bowman NYC conducts ions well because it's uh, disordered and ha it has these stacking faults. This particular uh, model here was an off-stoichiometric stacking fault. So it has these lithium-only layers. And the reason why we have a very high energy uh, for lithium migration in plane is because we have no vacant site in that lithium only layer, or we have very few of them. And this is more of an artifact of our model. It's more of an artifact of the calculation itself than a real insight in, into the real structure. So you can kind of ignore this high energy barrier here. Um, but so we uh, used, the models that we had obtained with synchrotron XRD um, 
uh, of our stacking faults and the lithium defects in these uh, structures. And here we're using a software that allows us to look at possible lithium ion uh, diffusion pathways through the solid, the, the solid structure. And what we find here is that uh, you have the different atoms here, the yellow uh, pathways are your lithium diffusion pathways. Uh, if you look at the same structure without the atoms for clarity, you see that these um, lithium pathways are uh, increased in density around the lithium defect layers. So these are the all lithium uh, layers. They are also increased in, uh, in density in certain areas of the stacking faults um, where you have uh, a reduced concentration of yttrium atoms. And so what this suggests is that in both cases, if you introduce lithium defect layers and stacking fault layers, you're increasing the 3D diffusion process in this particular structure. Uh, we were able to see this experimentally too. So we did here two types of experiments to look at to probe lithium ion conduction over different scales. Electrochemical impedance spectroscopy is a good technique to look at macro scale lithium diffusion, whereas pulse field gradient NMR uh, which we also have expertise in, is more looking at micron level lithium diffusion. And so we looked here at both the bull mills NYC system and the solid state NYC system. And we were able to obtain activation energy barriers from these measurements. Um, and in the case of PFG and MR, we can do, we can differentiate out of plane migration processes from in plane migration processes. Whereas yeah, uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy or EIS is more of a bulk technique. So you're really just getting an average migration barrier for your system. So if we look at the solid states uh, NYC results, we find that these energy barriers are very similar for all of these systems. Uh, well, across PFG NMR measurements and EIS, around 0.5 EV. But if you now look at the Bull Mills NYC, uh, you see that the energy barriers predicted from NMR measurements are much lower than the one obtained from electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And so in order to understand what was going on here, we decided to look at uh, different um, diffusion times in our NMR experiment. So what we're doing here is we're allowing lithium ions to diffuse over different time scales. Uh, so we can do this measurement quickly and we only allow lithium to diffuse uh, in a small portion, in a small region of space or over a small distance, or we can increase that distance by allowing it to diffuse for a longer amount of time. And what we found was that if uh, the distance that lithium was diffusing through was longer than the grain size, the average grain size in our system, then the diffusion, the diffusion coefficient of lithium was going down. So what this means is that while there is fast lithium diffusion inside each grain of our solids, so these energy barriers are low because we have good intragrain diffusion, but as soon as we hit a grain boundary, so between two crystals of NYC, um, now we have impedant diffusion across the grain boundary. And that's reducing, uh, that's increasing the energy barrier, but it's, it's reducing conductivity over uh, longer length scales. So now we have a full picture where we can see that the planar defects in bull mill NYC reduce the energy barrier from about 0.5 EV to about 0.2 EV in the system within a single crystal, within a single grain. But as uh, you cross grain boundaries, your ionic diffusion is impeded, uh, which increases that uh, barrier again. Okay, so I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, skip these conclusions here. Just to uh, summarize here, uh, we were able to make LYC through a uh, ball mill and introduce these planar defects in the system that will uh, favor lithium diffusion. It will improve lithium diffusion inside, inside each grain. Grain boundary is still the limiting factor here. We believe that these stacking faults can be found in other related systems. Um, we've been working with uh, a number of research groups at UC San Diego uh, on a very similar system, but this time for sodium ion batteries. And so this is a, a solid uh, electrolyte for sodium ion batteries that has the exact same formula as the one I've just discussed for lithium. Uh, however, the, the crystal structure of this particular material, NYC, is monoclinic. So it has a, a different crystal structure from NYC that I've discussed before. And this NYC structure has uh, some sodium ordering on the 2D and the 4E crystallographic sites. 
And what this means is that there is no, um, unlike NYC, so NYC, and I forgot to mention this, NYC had about a third of the lithium sites that were unoccupied. Uh, so you had lots of vacant sites in the structure that also improved lithium ion conduction. In this case, all of your sodium sites are filled. And so you don't have vacant sites and the ionic conductivity of the structure is a lot lower. So it's on the order of 10 to the minus eight Siemens per centimeter at room temperature. Um, so since we were collaborating with uh, Fieris here, this is Swastika who did a lot of DFT and molecular dynamics simulations for this uh, particular study, we decided to look at uh, substituting uh, yttrium by an alloy of valence ion. And the reason why we would do this is to introduce vacancies on the sodium lattice. So if we're able to introduce another transition metal here that has a, a valence of four plus instead of yttrium three plus, then we can reduce the amount of sodium in our lattice and introduce these sodium vacant sites that would improve sodium ion diffusion. And so what we found by comparing different dopant uh, species was that zirconium was a good candidate for, for substitution on the yttrium site because it had a, a, a low formation energy barrier, sorry, a low formation energy. And uh, it also allowed um, three, uh, an increase of three orders of magnitude in sodium ion conductivity. And so we decided to prepare this material and we, we made a, a series of systems from uh, the X equals zero composition. So this is your pure NYC. So no zirconium in this uh, material all the way to NZC. So here we have no yttrium anymore and we only have zirconium. And so we are going here in, in steps of 0.125. And what we found was that we had a solid solution. So we are not changing the crystal structure from X equals zero to X equal 0.875. And we still have the monoclinic structure throughout only the NZC end member has a different structure, which is similar to the one of LYC. Um, what we found was that in terms of ionic conductivity, that ionic conductivity goes up as you start to in, in, introduce zirconium in the system and create these sodium vacant sites. And it, in, it increases drastically up to 0.75, and then it's reduced a, li a little bit again. So clearly zirconium substitution is improving ionic conductivity. And now we have an ionic conductivity that's on the order of almost 10 to the minus four Siemens per centimeter, which is a lot higher um, than the initial NYC system that was more on the order of 10 to the minus eight. So since we are an NMR group, uh, we looked at the, the local environments of sodium in this system uh, to try to understand how that's, the structure is evolving across the series of samples and how that can be um, related to ionic conduction. And so we looked at the N member. So this is the NYC system, no zirconium, uh, all the way to the NZC system. What was surprising to us was that in NYC, we would expect two sodium sites. And we have a, a sodium chloride impurity in all of these, uh, of these uh, systems. But we also have a large number of environments uh, for sodium um, in the, in, the, in the actual material. And here we actually, we could make out five different environments for sodium, whereas we would expect two sodium sites uh, for pure NYC. Uh, for pure NZC, same story. So we, we would expect one sodium environment, but we have a lot more uh, resonances observed in NMR, suggesting that we have more local environments. Um, and so we might explain this by the fact that these materials are highly polymorphic, so they can form different crystal structures at the same time. And so we think this is what is going on in both of these end members. And we're trying to prove this right now with a follow-up study um, that will have a lot more NMR. Um, but so to now focusing on the intermediate structures, the ones that conduct sodium ion very well, what we find here is that we would expect to have a large number of sodium sites so to have a large number of, of environments or resonances in our spectrum. In the end, we don't see that many uh, signals because in NMR, if you have fast sodium, fast exchange of ions between sites, you can see an average uh, chemical shift. And so this is what we think is going on. So the sodium ion conductivity in these systems is sufficiently high that you're starting to average out resonances from different local environments. 
So how can we explain that this sodium conductivity is going up as we increase the amount of zirconium in the system? Well, first of all, we're increasing the volume of our unit cell as we increase the zirconium content. But then we're also increasing the size of the sodium ion conducting channels. And this was, this, these are results obtained by DFT. Our optimal uh, composition here at 0.75 zirconium is shown here. So it has the largest channel size. So it allows sodium ions to move more easily between uh, sites in the system. We did ab initio molecular dynamic simulations to look at sodium conduction and to compare it between our undoped system, so this is the NYC system, and the substituted system, where we have about 0.75 zirconium. And what we found was that after substitution, sodium is much more mobile. So your blue uh, spheres here are showing you the trajectory of sodium ions um, during that simulation. And so you can see here that you're connecting a lot of these sites in uh, the NYZC system compared to the NYC. What was more surprising though, was that if you look at the chlorine uh, motion, chlorine is also moving in the system, but it's actually moving locally. It's not like sodium. Sodium is actually hopping between sites and it can move on the long, um, long range macroscopically um, uh, through the material. But chlorine here is not quite static. It's also moving, but locally. Uh, in fact, if we were to freeze the, the motion of these chlorine atoms, we would also uh, restrict the motion of sodium ions. So what we believe is going on here is that as sodium is moving through the lattice, your polyhedra, which are these transition metal uh, Cl6 polyhedra, are also able to shift around and they're able to assist sodium motion by, by, being, by rotating around uh, on their, uh, at their position. All right, so what's exciting about this work is also that um, if you make a full solid state uh, sodium ion battery, uh, these types of, of systems work very well. So here we're comparing the performance of an all solid state battery where we have our anode, our cathode that's mixed with solid electrolytes and our solid electrolyte layer. This is a sulfide solid electrolyte. And we are now looking at the charge and, sorry, the charge and the discharge curves over uh, hundreds of cycles here. And what we see, if you look at the capacity versus the voltage of your cell, the capacity goes down with cycle number. So you have a, a, a very significant capacity fade in the system. Um, but if we look at our particular solid electrolyte here, so here we only use the solid electrolyte on the cathode side because it's very stable against, at high voltages, it's less stable at low voltages. So we are only using it on the cathode side. And here we have a much more stable electrochemical performance uh, for up to cycle 160. And uh, impressively, for if you if you cycle this particular material for thousand a thousand of cycles, uh, you still get about 90% of the capacity retained after a thousand cycles. So this is uh, extremely good. And in fact, if you compare this to prior work, our work here is showing a sodium ion all solid state battery that can cycle well for thousands of cycles, um, which hadn't been reported before. Uh, if you now look at the capacity retention with cycle number, this particular cell also performs extremely well compared to prior work. So the main takeaway from this uh, uh, work was that we were able to uh, design this NYZC system uh, computationally. And what we found was that by in, in incorporating sodium vacancies in the system, uh, expanding the, lat the volume of that uh, particular unit cell and allowing rotation of polyhedra, we're really improving sodium ion diffusion. Um, these electrolytes are interesting because they're, they're stable against high voltage cathodes, such as the sodium chromium oxide cathodes, and they can be cycled for thousands of cycles uh, with a losing minimal capacity. So I can see that I'm almost over time and I haven't really talked about the polymer system, so I'm gonna skip that and I'll move on to my uh, acknowledgement slide here. So let me do that. Um, I actually have to... Great, oops, sorry, too far. All right. So uh, the, the work I've presented today uh, was really work by Elias here with the help of Pete. Um, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, uh, at 
NIST at uh, NUS and at, the, at UC Santa Barbara, at UC San Diego too, uh, on the work I've presented today, and of course my funders. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so yes. much for an absolutely incredible talk um, and some really incredible measurements. It's exciting to see how you've combined all the different types of NMR and electron microscopy. And thank you so much for explaining it all to us. Can we sure. have a question from Dominic? I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, NYC and NZC systems. Uh, so these ternary lanthanide chlorides, they can be very hygroscopic. Uh, are these systems hygroscopic? So yes. From my previous experience with working with sodium containing solids, which are hygroscopic, you detect a lot of species which are not related to the crystal structure itself, is just the hydrated species. So could yeah. that be? So we are always extremely careful. Um, we have seen, so they are extremely hygroscopic, that's for sure. Uh, we handle them in a glove box. We've even done, what we've done was, uh, because we were really paranoid about uh, whether what we were doing in our NMR measurement was uh, looking at a, a hydrated version of the system or not. Um, so we did stability tests too. And we realized that, yes, if you were to expose it to a little bit of air or moisture, then it starts to decompose and it starts to change your uh, spectrum. So we did all of these stability tests too, and we were confident that the ones that we've looked at and were packed um, in very airtight rotors for solid state and MR, these ones were fine. But you're right, we have we always have to be very careful about this. Great, thank you very much. And same for NYC for, for the lithium system was also hygroscopic. Yeah. Yes, a couple of questions. Happy to to take questions. Oh, hi. Hi. I, I have a question, but I guess you didn't uh, cover that because I wanted to to know like uh, this uh, halide system, were, were they, did you investigate them when uh, with the polymers too? Um, no, so the polymers don't have, well, yeah, they don't really, they don't have halides. Uh, do you mean combining both? So making a composite of a polymer and the halide solid? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. no, we've not we've not looked into this. Um, we've been looking at both of these systems separately. Okay, okay, but it's possible to combine them, yeah. It Maybe is possible it's... to combine them. Yes, you're right. There's a lot of research being done with composite solid electrolytes to get the be best of both worlds to to get the ionic the selectivity of lithium ion motion in solid elect in inorganic solids and to get the ductility of polymers, for instance. So combining them can be a good option. Okay, yeah, because I'm working on the uh, PEO, but yeah. uh, so because of its processability is good. So I think like uh, maybe the halide system, they are not that good mechanically. So maybe if you can combine them, that could be a good combination. Yeah, we haven't looked into this, so I can't really tell you if, it's, if it works or not. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Uh, Yang, you've got a question. I can also see in the chat. Sorry, uh, I don't know if you can see me. I'm actually on the train going home. <laughs> Sorry if I have a noisy background. So um, I, I have a few questions more on the general level. So please bear with me. Um, and then I'm more of a battery. Um, so you present uh, maybe if you are able to type in the chat, that would work better because we you you're cutting a lot. We're looking at the wondering um how to further down to the spectrum get. It's fine. I'll just type into the chat. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we can take another question in the meantime. Uh, Dominic, yes. Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I, I enjoyed the, the TEM data from the L LYS, was it? Uh, the, the, so uh, LYC. Yeah, LYC. Yes, you, you couldn't get uh, any data from the Bowmill sample. 
but nowadays uh, we, we have these direct electron detectors and they're really good for studying beam sensitive samples. So if you have access to that, you could probably get a uh, good well, data. We tried a lot of things. So we tried cryo TM. Um, I don't know if this is even softer or it's it allows you to look at even more uh, beam sensitive materials than cryo TM because supposedly cryo TM is good for um, helping with the with metastable materials but yeah so, so having a direct electron detector is critical and then you can go to really really low doses so we, yeah. we work with halide perovskites which, which have organic cations which degrade immediately and we found that if you go to really low doses you can image and uh, okay. i think for detecting metastable defects uh, it might be the, the way to go uh, yeah. but yeah really cool data thank you um, so maybe I'll take Yang's question in the chat and then I'll ask uh, Sack. Uh, so about the capability of the technology when the level of defect increases, even reaching the state of an amorphous structure. So do you mean, so this is the cap capability of NMR, I think. So NMR is a, a local structure technique. So it doesn't matter if you're looking at uh, an amorphous or a crystalline material. You'll always be able to see the local environments um, and you can, infer uh, about your your local structure so to look at defects this is a, a very good technique because you, it doesn't matter if it's very crystalline disordered or even amorphous you can obtain information on the structure anyway it's not like synchrotron or it's not like diffraction because you're not uh, sensitive to the long range order you're, you're sensitive to the local order it's about <laughs> Oh, oh, potassium NMR. No, you can't do this. Sorry. <laughs> potassium is a terrible NMR nucleus. So yeah, that's one of the, the problem with NMR is that you need a good NMR nucleus too. So it works well for lithium batteries. It works well for sodium batteries because lithium and sodium are good NMR nuclei. Uh, potassium, unfortunately, is not a good nucleus. It doesn't have, uh, it's not magnetically susceptible. So very bad signal. Uh, yes, uh, Sarah or Sally. Um, so I'm talking from the other end of the scientific career. Um, when I was an undergraduate, um, electric vehicles were considered completely limited to the milk floats that operated, delivering your milk to your door on old fashioned acid batteries. And theoreticians were also considered completely useless unless you were interested in the properties of hydrogen. Um, things have changed very dramatically in science. And that was an extremely impressive talk where you were pulling together not only very demanding theoretical calculations, but also a range of experimental techniques. And you know, it was interesting to hear that a referee told you to put it in the electron microscope where the problems of actually the technique of observing what's going on can destroy your sample. And yeah. the current need for theoretical, implementing both theoretical and different types of experimental things that often all have their different limitations to actually try and get a picture of what's going on. This is sort of leading to a question in that um, you are talking about materials for your electrolytes where you've got to have very, in your experiments, very good control over the degree of disorder if you're introducing defects by ball milling, the temperature, the chemical composition, etc., of going on. What do you think are the big barriers to actually having those um, solid state batteries being manufactured such that we will have them in our vehicles or other things? Yes, very good question. Thank you. Um, so if, well, if we're able to find uh, a way to make them in a very controllable manner, um, Obviously, this is very much needed when we want to manufacture uh, uh, some of these solid electrolytes. 
What we found for LYC, uh, so the first material I discussed for lithium ion batteries, was that not only do you have a huge um, dependence on your processing condition, even the amount of off stoichiometry in the system, and that all, all of this impacts lithium ion conduction. So, of course, you need to, to be able to control all of this. I don't think this is really a feasible system for, uh, for a broader uh, implementation, especially because what I didn't show today was that we did some stability uh, tests with this particular material. So we took the bull mill that YC system, and we even just heated it to 60 degrees Celsius for a couple of hours, and then looked at the solid state NMR. So there we looked at lithium NMR. And we looked at lithium NMR before we did that heat treatment, after we did that heat treatment, and we went to different temperatures. And what we saw was that even at 60 degrees Celsius, your structure is starting to rearrange. So it's mm -hmm. that metastable. Uh, so I don't think this is a good material to put in a, in a, in a real um, uh, battery <laughs> for that reason. So yes, we, we need to, to find other less metastable systems. The problem is, and I actually mentioned that at some point, there is a trade-off between ionic conductivity and stability in solid electrolytes. So the more metastable ones are the better conductors, and the more stable ones are not as good conductors. Yeah. Thanks. But, you know, if we think of how much work went into the silicon revolution in electronics yeah. and that materials um, and rewards for better batteries, um, you know, the prospects are good, but there are going to be many um, materials that look promising and then um, a fundamental flaw needs to be distinguished from a operational um, floor. So it's exciting times. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll take a question from Suzanne in the chat. So could, could a copper system be utilized? So I think you mean copper uh, conduct conduction. So a copper iron battery. Um, is that, I think this is what you mean. Um, so it depends on the oxidation state of copper here, uh, but I would think that copper diffusion is going to be difficult in the solid state, and so this would be a big barrier for, for copper ion battery. Not that many ions can conduct well in the solid state. Yeah. So I'm happy to take one more question. I have to go teach after this, so uh, I have to go soon. <laughs> there is um, one more from Yang in the chat. Yeah. Um, no, you, when you work with electric materials. And there okay. is also a question from an undergrad on your career progression, if you. Oh, OK. Where is that? Maybe I should do that first. Do you okay. see? It was sent privately yeah. to me. It was just um, she's interested in your how you got to where you are now and if you have any tips for your younger self. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got to where I am now. So I, I think I mentioned this to a small group of people before I arrived here. So I've spent most of my time in the UK as a undergrad and grad student, and then I moved to the US for postdoc. Um, that sequence of events was very much of uh, encounters with people I wanted to work with. So um, as an undergrad, I did my final uh, senior thesis, which involved research with Claire Gray, and I really enjoyed working for her, so I decided to stay with her. Uh, so I'd say I'd, I wouldn't do things differently, uh, but if I had a tip, I would say make sure you enjoy working with your advisor. Your PhD advisor is very important in your life, especially if you want to be a researcher afterwards. Uh, so pick that advisor very well. Um, if you can get to work with that person before doing a PhD with that person, then that's great. Um, so I, I worked for her for a long time, and then I moved to the US and worked for, for Gerbrand Seder. Also had a good experience there. Um, and I got a job in, in California. So I, I was really planning on going back to Europe after this, but I got a job here and it's a, it's a good position. So it ended up being this way. So not, uh, nothing planned in too, uh, too much in advance, but it, things turned out well. Thanks very much. Sure. 
So I'm, I'm happy if you have questions for me that I haven't answered, I'm happy if you send me an email too. Okay, um, thank you. Oh, hi, I think, uh, like, if you don't mind, I think that's a good question. Ian's question about uh, electronic conductivity and ionic conductivity, do you mind covering that? Oh, yeah. Um, it's just that I have to leave in, uh, I'll, I'll leave in a few minutes because I, I have to teach. <laughs> oh, okay. um, but I can, I can answer a very short question then. Um, I wonder when you work with electric materials rather than solid electrons, how do you balance between the impact of, you discussed a lot of carbon has to be a trade-off. No, not necessarily. So, um, so for solid electrolytes, we're, we're interested in ionic conductivity, and we really do not want any electron. Well, we want a good electronic insulator uh, because of issues of short circuiting your cell. For cathode or anode materials, now we're interested in dual um, uh, conduction where we can conduct electrons and, and ions. Um, there's no trade off between the two. Um, but it limits the, the, the number of materials that you can use. So uh, for instance, some materials are just poor electronic conductors and they won't make for a good electron, um, a, a good electrode material. They might get, be good ionic conductors, but they're poor electronic conductors. And that's typically difficult to get around. Uh, you can mix them with, with conductive carbon, which improves the electronic conductivity to some extent. But for instance, we're working with fluorides and here we're having a, a very hard time because they're very poor electronic conductors. So you're right, in, to some extent, now you, you have two requirements to fulfill and that can be more difficult to meet. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for the, uh, the invitation, Kara. Thank you so much for talking to us and, and showing off your incredible, incredible research. And we're very grateful for you speaking to the society. Thank you. This is a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank All you. Right. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Um, we usually now stay to chat for a, a bit of an informal chat. If you'd like to stay, um, I'll end the recording.